Hello everyone, welcome to another session for ARD question series. Uh, my name is Sansa Nora Sama and I've done my bachelor's in horticulture honors and my, also I've completed my master's in hematology and agriculture. So for today I have selected five questions again as usual um, on the same topic on the soil science and we just subdivided into nutrients and fertilizers, water conservation, soil conservation and initiatives by the government. So don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon and please do like the video if you have liked this session. So moving on to the first question, which element helps in promoting the root zone? So first and foremost, we need to understand what a mineral element is. So min mineral elements, these are an element which are essential to the plants for the growth and proper development, right? So these are these elements help in the metabolic functions of the of the plants, and uh, without these, the plants cannot complete its normal life cycle, right? So uh, without these nutrients and this mineral elements, they will show some visual deficiency symptoms in the plant, right? So essentially there are 16 essential elements right which was given by arnon and stout in the 1939 uh, the main abundant is carbon hydrogen and oxygen all right and so we're left with 13 nutrients and these can be further divided into micro macronutrients and micronutrients Right, so these are classified on the basis of this uh, relative abundance. Um, in macronutrients, we have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And on the other hand, for micronutrients, we have zinc, iron, chlorine, boron, manganese, and molybdenum. Other than this, we have some beneficial um, nutrients like vanadium, sodium, cobalt, as well as silicon, all right? It's very important to know their roles. Each of these elements have their own particular roles and they play a very vital role in the proper functioning of the uh, plants. And each of these will have their different distinctive deficiency symptoms as well. So if, to make it easier, I've made a table here uh, which shows the role of all these mineral nutrients. So let's go on to the first one. Nitrogen, it imparts a green color, vegetative, it increases the vegetative growth as well, and it is essential constituent of protein. Phosphorus, whereas it, it increases disease resistance, root development, constituent of nucleic acid and phytin. Potassium, on the other hand, it helps in the stomata regulation, that is the opening and the closing of the stomata. And it in also increases the photosynthetic rate and it, dis it, is also, it also helps in a disease resistant. Calcium, on the other hand, it's a constituent of a cell wall. Magnesium is a constituent of chlorophyll. Okay, so sulfur is a constituent of amino acid as well. And it also improves in the soil or in the oil content in oil seeds and pulses. So iron, it helps in the nitrogen fixation enzyme and oxidation it is also an enzyme and oxidation reduction process right so manganese it helps in the formation of chlorophyll and copper it helps in photosynthesis as well as respiration boron it helps in pollen germination and it is a non-metal element in the whole of micronutrients and zinc it helps in the biosynthesis of plants hormones right so in this other picture uh, this picture is basically it depicts the uh, symptoms on the different uh, areas of a plant by the de uh, deficiency of the nutrients as I've also already discussed so I won't be going in detail if you want you can take you can pause the video and you can take a screenshot of these uh, of this slide you can zoom in and check out and read properly so let's go back to the question which element helps in promotion promoting the root zone uh, a is nitrogen b phosphorus c potassium d sulfur the main uh, the correct answer for this is phosphorus right as it helps in the promote uh, in promoting the root zone and in the formation of the roots so the second question is based on uh, second question says based on the geographical area of types of watershed choose the correct order so in this 
table, I have given the types of watershed and as well as the uh, size or the area um, that is given for different types of watershed. The first one is macro watershed and it covers the area of more than 50,000 hectares and sub watershed it covers the area of 10,000 to 50,000 hectares. Milli watershed covers about 1,000 to 10,000 and micro watershed from 100 to 1,000. The last one, the mini, it covers about 1 to 100 hectares. The, these are in the decreasing, uh, decreasing orders. Uh, so let's just read A, macro watershed, milli watershed, mini and sub. This is wrong. Sub watershed, milli watershed, mini watershed, micro watershed. This is also wrong. Milli watershed, sub watershed, micro watershed, and mini watershed it's wrong the last option uh, sub watershed milli watershed micro watershed and mini watershed so this is the correct order of the types of watershed so um, let's just simply try to understand what a watershed is so a watershed is basically uh, an area of land that feeds all the water running under it and draining off of it into a body of water right so it combines uh, with other watersheds to form a network of rivers and streams that progressively drain into a larger area as you can see in this picture all these are coming together to form into a single stream which will form into a larger stream and which will in turn uh, form a, a bigger water body so basically our water shed is also known as a drainage basin as it creates a channel or a drainage uh, naturally this watershed is topographical and hydrologically in nature like it's formed from the rain or the melting of the uh, snow or the mountain caps or the ice it will converge into a same single point and it will form to the exit drainage and it will come into a bigger water body so it's also known as the catchment area or the catchment basin or the river basin as well these are the, some of the other names for watershed Think of it as a funnel where the drainage of it comes from a drop by drop into the river, into the soil as a water and then which will act in turn as the groundwater which can be seeped through any of this land through water or any uh, wetlands. So it will come in, it would act as a groundwater and in turn this groundwater will go into the river and this river or the streams will definitely go into a an ocean or an sea. This is not just confined to the rivers or the rainfall or the um, or the mountain waterfalls or the all these snow caps. It's also it can be in a form of um, in urban areas, in the playgrounds or in schools or in in the houses as well. So it will seep into the soil and it will act as a run water. So all of these in total it helps in the formation of this drainage basin which will in turn act as a drainage of the water and it will move into the major water body because of the change in the environment and the topography and the geograph geographical features of the land there are a couple of due to this there's a more loss of water and to conserve the water we need a watershed management so these watershed management have few objectives but i've only uh, highlighted only five of it there are more of it actually so let's just read uh, all of these objectives together first one being to control damage runoff and degradation and thereby conservation of soil and water the second one is to manage and utilize a runoff water for useful purpose and the third one is to protect to conserve and improve the land of watershed for more efficient and sustainable production Number four, to protect and enhance the water resources originating in the watershed. Fifth being to check soil erosion and to reduce the effects of sediment yield of, on the watershed. So moving on to the next slide. This slide is uh, based on the initiatives or the of programs and um, schemes for the watershed management. The first one, these are the programs on watershed management. First one being the drought prone area program desert development program and integrated wasteland development program so try to remember the key features and the implementation date uh, for all of these 
And the scheme that is under the watershed development is Prime Minister Krishi Sinchaya Yojana as well. Okay. And the last one is Niranchal Watershed Program. So this this was actually done by a world by the World Bank who assisted the National Watershed Management Project. So for all of these, try to read in detail or maybe just have a brief idea of what all of these uh, their main objectives and the features of all of these along with their dates. So if I've missed out few, uh, if I've missed out some of the watershed programs or the schemes, please don't forget to drop by the comment and let me know. All right. So the third one is um, which microorganism is most suitable as biofertilizers of legumes, oil legumes, and fodder legumes? The options are azola, azosper, rhizobium, azospirillum, and number D is blue green algae. So first and foremost, we need to understand what uh, biofertilizers are. Biofertilizers are nothing but fertilizers with uh, microorganisms which help to improve the soil physical properties as well as chemical properties and also increase in the microbial activity of the soil. So this increase in the microbial activity of the soil will in turn help in the uptake of the nutrients and it will make the nutrients more available for the plants. This can be applied to the, to the plant through in a in the form of a seed or soil or composting right so this biofertilizers can be of uh, my nitrogen fixing microbes and these nitrogen fixing microbes are further divided into three such as free living associative symbiosis and a symbiotic relation okay so this free living can be anaerobic and the example for this would be azotobacter so it creates a symbiotic relationship with with rice wheat and some vegetables and uh, the another one is aerobic we have clostridium right so under associate we have a symbiotic a relationship between the azospirillum. So these are mostly uh, in a symbiotic relationship with the grasses or sorghum, pearl millets. The last one, symbiotic, it can be further divided into nitrogen, uh, into uh, nodules and without nodules. So with, with nodules, we have um, rhizobium. And we have actinomycetes. Actinomycetes are nothing but a fungi, okay? And without nodules, we have um, blue-green algae. And this blue-green algae is nothing but, um, it's also known as the anabena azole. The, these uh, form a symbiotic, uh, formation, a symbiotic relationship with the water plant or water fern known as azola. This rhizobium is nothing but uh, it has a symbiotic relationship with the legumes and it helps in the nitrogen fixation, right? So they usually produce no dew. So let's go back to the question, which microorganism is mostly used as a biofertilizer of pulse legumes or legumes and other legumes? So whenever you see in um, these biofertilizers and whenever you have to deal with the legumes, it's always with the rhizobium. So the correct answer for this is rhizobium. Right, because azola is nothing but a water fern and as a spirulum, it does not deal with legumes and it because it has a symbiotic relationship with the grasses and blue-green algae has a symbiotic relationship with, with azola. So let's go to the next question. Uh, in relation to the soil health card, H, SHC, which of the following statements is an incorrect? Uh, a. HSC is a centrally sponsored nationwide scheme which aims to help farmers to improve their productivity of farms by providing them basic information for the use of nutrients or fertilizers. Number B, Soil Health Card SHC scheme was announced by NDA government led by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi it's in its first budget presented in July 2013. Number C says Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched nationwide HSC scheme in Suratgarh town of Sri Ganga Ganganagar district of Rajasthan. And number D is Punjab was the first state in India to issue the soil health card. So I would like you all to please um, comment the answer for this question. And if you have any queries, please don't forget to ask. 
So moving on to another question. This is the last question for today. Okay, it's about erosion. Let's read the question. Sheet erosion is caused by number A, fast running rivers, number B, heavy rains, number C, wind, and number D, glaciers. Uh, usually erosions can be caused by water or wind, right? Um, soil erosion is nothing but the wearing away of the topsoil. The topsoil is the... So what, a to, what is the topsoil? The topsoil is the top layer of the soil and is the most fertile because it contains the most organic nutrient rich materials. As you can see in this picture, these are some of the live pictures of soil erosion. It's usually dry and cracked where the rich or an organic nutrient layer has been washed off by the water or the wind. So there are different causes of soil erosion. It can be by the humans and the increased use in the land use as well due to the increase in the agriculture cultivation as well as the in increase in the natural increase in the use of the natural resources like such as deforestation felling of the trees and improper use of all the cropping systems and their faulty farming systems as well and because due to this they create a barren land and due to the barren land the soils they become loose and there's nothing to hold them properly so with the, if there were trees in the land so the soil becomes more firm but without in the barren land the soil becomes less firm and they are not more compact and they are more vulnerable for water runoff or the erosion okay and um, so in this picture i've given the process or the action related in the soil erosion the first one is the detachment all right the detachment of the soil and then the soil will transport and it will deposit in another form right so this is this is the simple process of soil erosion. Other than that, there are other factors that causes the soil er uh, that causes soil erosion. The first one being the climate, the wind velocity, the precipitation, and soil. The soil physical properties as well as the hydrological properties also affect the um, soil erosion. And then the land forms as well. The geographical uh, distribution of the land and the geographical uh, properties of the land also causes soil erosion as in for example in the more slopey area there'll be more erosion and in the lesser slopey area there'll be lesser soil erosion so there are different uh, types of soil erosion uh, let's just discuss each of these one by one the first one is splash erosion the splash erosion is one of the common this this is caused due to the rain so what happens here is that um, once the rain hits the ground it will form a splash the force of these rain will splash the soil particles and it will deposit it will make a deposit into another area right so this causes the soil erosion and the second one is sheet erosion so in sheet erosion it's the same thing as splash erosion but these are mostly in the uh, flatter surface so in the rain it drops and it disperses the soil particles and it forms a mound on the surface of the land. So this is nothing but a sheet erosion, right? This is one of the most unnoticeable um, type of soil erosion and these are all caused by the water, right? So um, in real erosion, what happens is that during to the, due to the rain and there's a lot of runoff of the water and which creates uh, cracks and surfaces in the land, all right? So these as you can see here these cracks and surfaces are created and these are the rill this rill is usually in a height of about not more than 0.3 meter right and the more advanced form of this real erosion is gully erosion gully erosions they are more wider and more advanced the erosion is more advanced and it is more dangerous than the real or any other erosion the size may be more than 0.3 meter or it's more deeper than 0.3 meter so this real erosion can be um it can be rectified by good tillage practices where the gully erosion they cannot be rectified by, by tillage practices these are some of the types of soil erosion but there are another t there are more types like tunnel erosion or the stream bank erosion as well and uh, in this 
slide uh, I've given us uh, some uh, live pictures of different types of erosion the first one is the um, soil er slash erosion sorry so here as we've discussed in the flat surfaces this will be the sheet and this will be for the uh, normal splash erosion so in sheet erosion what happens here is that the raindrop the force will be high so it will disperse the soil particles in and around then that for in that way it will create an un undulated uh, land and uneven land surfaces in and around as you can see then this is related to sheet erosion in this picture as you can see in this flat surface the the land becomes uneven and so this type is known as the sheet erosion right so this the third picture here these are the rills all right so these are formed due to the uh, water runoff and these are as we've discussed earlier it's not more than 0 0.3 the fourth picture depicts the gully erosion right so these are it's the most dangerous and it's the most advanced form of the real erosion as you can see in the picture and it's more deeper and it's more wider as well right so the fifth picture is on scalding scalding is nothing by the common it's nothing but an erosion which is uh, caused by the combination of the water and wind velocity uh, and wind velocity due to which they expose the uh, alkaline and the sodic soils the sixth one this erosion is also known as a tunnel what happens here is that there's a removal of the subsoil so what happens is that there's a removal of the subsoil surfaces and the water penetrates due to the rain the water penetrates through it but usually uh and the soil it cracks and it opens along the uh, decayed wood area right and so after the soil disperses they are carried away to leave a small tunnel right initially these may be a very small hole but after a long period of time it becomes more and more bigger and larger and thus it creates a tunnel so this uh, is also one of the forms uh, types or the forms of soil erosion let's go back to the question the sheet erosion is caused by fast running rivers this is wrong and b heavy rains so this is the right answer well, that's all for today thank you so much and please don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon and don't forget to hit the like button if you have liked this session